This episode is brought to you by Chekhov's Ornamental Firearms. Look, it happens. Sometimes you walk into a dinner party or a one-act play and plunk down a fine BFG. Not so you can fire it, because that would be rude and maybe illegal. No, sometimes you only want to put it on a table and remark on it just so your guests can admire its craftsmanship. For that, you need Chekhov's Ornamental Firearms. Chekhov's purely ornamental heaters are perfect reproductions of the real thing. The grooved rifling, authentic firing pins, explosive ammo, genuine serial numbers, and real city permits. So go ahead and let the kids play with it. It wasn't designed for shooting. And Chekhov's offers a full line of loaded gats for you to display in an intimate setting in a completely non-ominous way. Revolvers, derringers, lugers, and blunderbusts. If you want to show off a smoke wagon in a way that doesn't forebode anything at all, Chekhov's is your one-stop, just-for-show biscuit store. Thank you, Chekhov's Ornamental Firearms, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. Warning. The following discussion is deliberately riddled with spoilers and unhinged speculation on this nearly 40-year-old book, Gene Wolfe's The Book of the New Sun. You can't read a Gene Wolfe story. You can only reread a Gene Wolfe story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. We don't pretend that this is the first time you and we have read these books. We want to understand them in as much detail as possible, and that means considering the works as a whole. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. Not a lot of comments on last week's episode, really, Craig. It's all right. It was a short one. Yeah, but I'm a bit surprised by this. I mean, granted, it was a short episode, but I recall that on the Earth list, there was quite a heated conversation about whether Father Aniri with his monkey face was in disguise every time a monkey appeared or someone (laughs) or something with red hairy arm showed up. Fetchin was an Aniri Mm -hmm. suspect. So was Rudison with his long monkey hands. Alas, you know. Well, maybe we should have um, requested certain theories by name. <laughs> like, tell us who this monkey dog boy is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, oh, yeah. You know, we maybe I should have just dragged all that out. I mean, it wasn't directly <laughs> related, but it, it, if I'd known. Oh, well, no one cared about that. At least not the last two weeks. Maybe Eventually someone will. But anyway, that blue light, I think that was at least as interesting as the baboon nurse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Let it go, man. Let it go. <laughs> On Reddit, Cody Martin wasn't willing to spin a monkey theory about Aniri, but he did point out that, quote, Aniri's title of father implies that he's some kind of religious official. He is also associated with apes. The word primate can similarly refer to a high-ranking religious official or an ape. It's unclear whether it was intentional on Wolf's part, but I still think it's an amusing pun. Well, you know, it seems unlikely that Wolf would miss a pun. But, you know, well done, Cody. So is this like Planet of the Apes and these are, what was, what's the, it was, it was Professor Bobo or is that actually, that's just Mystery Science Theater. That's all I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's, (laughs) you get get confused. You're thinking of Zayas? Yeah, yes. Yep, that's what it is. But on (laughs) MST in the sci-fi years, he was Professor Bobo. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Also on Reddit, uh, Michael Andre Dirisi anticipated that this chapter might not have as much meat for people to sink their teeth into. And he proposed that we talk about the Netflix series Travelers and how its time mechanics could be applicable to the way, say, an earlier iteration of Severian might fiddle with his own timeline and not be erased by it. Did you ever watch Travelers, Craig? I haven't even watched Dark yet. So speaking of all these time travel shows. Watch Travelers first. It's It's really good. Three seasons. Very satisfying ending. Good time travel, not irritating time travel. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm going to talk about it a little bit and maybe there's a little bit of, maybe it's a spoiler to like the end of the first season, I guess. So skip ahead a few minutes. You're, you're on your own. Yeah. Um, what happens is that they kind of embrace the grandfather paradox in that they're there to change the future because it's so awful and they're successful, but it doesn't change anything about the future. It just causes the future to change so that when more people come back from the future, they've got a different past than the one that they left. Gotcha. So in that case, it's, you know, it kind of works like that. The uh, Michael, of course, has always had, you know, even when he first explained the first Severian theory to me, he's always had a different concept of how it worked than what I gravitated to. He thinks Severian 
is going back and he's essentially erasing his own timeline. But the question is, you know, I've always had is, well, why doesn't he, you know, wink out? Yeah. Why doesn't he pull on Michael J. Fox? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Michael says, well, you know, there's a number of details. For example, in Travelers, there are a few couples. So he kind of applies this, the the way the couples work in Travelers to Severian and Agia. He says, applying this to first Severian and Agia, if they were a couple, only for Severian knows how it went when uh, Sev met, he says, uh, when Sevi met Agali. And <laughs> I do not think that Severian or Agia have any real memories of it, but they probably have their shared sense of how things would have gone if it were not for all these distractions, uh, including that, you know, Dorcas. <laughs> so I responded, you know, well, well, then what do you think of Agia's breakdown about the note? Is she really just janked by Severian's relationship with Vodalus, or is it from some sense of how things went in the first iteration? And he says, well, you know, I go along with the threads that, you know, we were discussing. Agia knows the name Vodalus, probably better than an apprentice of the torturers, and discovered that her gullible Mark Sev has some connection on the side of Vodalus is very unsettling development. Agia is coming to understand that her dippy, gullible Mark Sev is really a government employee torturer, another unsettling revelation, and mm -hmm. probably the worst of all. And probably worst of all, Agia has fallen in love with the Mark. Yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. And even then, when we were talking about it before, that if they did have some kind of uh, not exactly memory of it, but just felt some deep connection between things that they wouldn't necessarily have to have actual concrete memories of a different timeline, but rather it's some sort of mystical, you know, I feel related to you or mm -hmm. something like that, yeah. that could well be working. Right. I don't know. You know, every yeah. one of the theories I pose feels good for a, a little bit of a stretch and then something else <laughs> feels better. <laughs> Nothing really hangs. She is slippery. She's slippery. Okay. So Severian is going to go visiting some orphans in prison today. That's fun. It's a nice, it's like it's his philanthropic moment, right? He's quite, yeah, he's Mr. Charitable. Chapter 29, Agilus. All right, Craig, this is a short chapter, but it has a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. I anticipate a long episode, so y'all might want to get a cup of coffee for this. It's still the day after the Avern duel. Last night, Severian was carried in on a stretcher. I'm assuming it's just after breakfast. It's about 24 hours since Severian met Asia outside her rag shop. With Dorcas on hand, the doctor in charge of the lazarette examines Severian and determines that he's perfectly healthy. So he asks them to leave because Severian's outfit is, quote, upsetting to his patients. <laughs> So they go to the other side of the Hall of Justice, the other side from the Destriers and the Troopers, where Severian encountered the commissary. There's an inexpensive gift shop where they bought clothes for Dorcas. Remember, she's still in those rags from the Garden of Sleep. He spent most of his money at the Inn of Lost Loves. Never ate that dinner, they ordered, unless Asha went to fill up after Severian was killed and Nagelus <laughs> was arrested. So he's Pretty close to broke, but he still has enough money to buy Dorcas a Seamar. A Seamar is a wraparound dress. The street entrance to the Hall of Justice is close to the shop, and about 100 people are mobbing in front of it. They're pointing at them when they see Severian's cloak, so they go back around to the back of the building to the Destrios. I guess the reason they're pointing at him is that, oh, that's the, the Carnifex. He's going to chop off uh, Agilus' head. A port reeve comes to the Hall of Justice and approaches them. A port reeve is the chief executive official in a port town. Here he seems to be taking orders from the local Chiliarch. This guy is tall. Severium calls him an imposing man. He has a high white forehead like the belly of a pitcher, a, a pitcher to pour water out of, not a baseball pitcher. So he's balding with a big head. He's very tall. He's tall. If, if Severian calls him imposing, he doesn't say that he's an exultant, so he probably isn't, but he's just tall. The big guy. The Port Reef says, you are the Carnifex. That's what he says, you know, unnecessarily, because he obviously, <laughs> he was told he was healed enough to do his Carnifexing. And Severian says, yes, yeah, he is. 
He says he can do whatever they need to do him to do today. Today, but we won't finish the trial until this afternoon. There's apparently not a lot of doubt about the guy's guilt. And of course, there there's really isn't. He doesn't mention it, but this is Ajlis's trial. It'll be a reveal to Severian when he finds out. But it shouldn't be a big surprise even to a first-time reader. And in the Commonwealth, there aren't enough legal rules for there to be loopholes for an obviously guilty defendant to slip through. Right. It's interesting, too, that this is a moment where Severian remarks on judgments and the goodness or sort of hastiness of them, Mm -hmm. because, of course, he's been told that that's not a torturous place, right? He's just there to carry out the sentence. So for him at this point, it's very, it's very, it goes by so quickly, but for him to already be remarking on that just already is setting him on the path of just like he had done with Thecla of saying, well, is this actually just, you know, Mm -hmm. even though he knows it is, even though he, he knows full well what Agilus had done, he's a little bit bugged by how summary all of this is. It's a tiny thing, but it it's going against what he's been trained to do. Although he does at this point in the story, and maybe that's really is true him looking back, but at this point in the story, he's actually a little anxious to get started. Yeah, there is that too. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Because this is Agilus's case, and Agilus killed nine people in front of witnesses and was apprehended on the spot. There's no powerful person pleading his case, no chance of pardon or appeal. As the Port Reeve says, he's of no consequence. The tribunal will pass sentence tomorrow, mid-morning, and they'll need Severian to execute him around noon or after lunch. This is a little surprising that Severian has no direct experience with the courts. It, it was Gerloise's job to deal with court officials. Severian has only had to deal with their decisions, not the process of making those decisions. But right. And like I said, Severian is actually anxious to finally try out the job he's been trained his whole life for. So he says, well, how about he does the execution tonight by torchlight? So, you know, he's really anxious to get his hands dirty. Mm-hmm. But of course, that's very naive. The Chiliarch has to make a show of carefully considering his ruling. There's a political aspect since it conveys to the people that the military leaders, although not elected, are not making decisions off the cuff, shooting from the hip so to speak. Even though individualized justice is not actually a particular concern, a non-military judge would probably take a week to make the decision. So the next day is lightning fast. So he says, uh, after lunch tomorrow? (laughs) And Severian says, well, they're going to need a room to sleep in. And Severian wants to approve the scaffold and the block today. It turns out this part is not only for show, so people won't think that just anyone could do the job properly. And also he needs to talk to his client. Yeah. And he's using the term client. He's using the word that has always been used and that we've heard many times back in the tower. Exactly. And he has to prepare him. So we'll get into that in a bit. The Port Reef says, well, can't you just stay in the Lazarette? Oh, so the three of them have to go to argue with the doctor who just kicked them out. (laughs) <laughs> but the doctor is king of the infirmary, and he's not negotiating at this point. And then they go talk to the Zanaji. Remember the Zanaji? No, the Carnivics can't sleep in the barracks with the troops. And if they give him an officer's cabin, no one will ever sleep there again. So at last, they clear out a windowless storeroom, put two beds in it, and some ratty furniture. Furniture that they can throw away afterwards, I suppose. He leaves Dorcas in the room and inspects the scaffold to make sure that he won't, quote, step through a rotten board at a critical moment or have to saw the client's head off while I hold him across my knee. <laughs> One thing, just to go back to the to the room, it is a little odd that in the last chapter, the soldiers were all buddy-buddy with him and saying, mm-hmm. yeah, come eat with us. Here's how to do this, giving him tips about how to help his women. But in this one, they're like, oh, but we, you're also still the Carnifex. And so- you to sleep with us now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are still limits. Then he goes to the client to, quote, make the call that our traditions demand, unquote. Surian says there's a difference between detention facilities to which one has become accustomed and those to which one has not. (laughs) Which is a weird way to put this. I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Like everyone's used to their own bedroom or Mm -hmm. used to their own 
school, but it's kind of weird when you go to somebody else's school. But here he's talking about prisons. Yeah. Um, Everyone's used to their own oubliette. It's when you go someplace else. (laughs) His oubliette in the mansion felt like home to him, right? Even if he was going to be executed himself, he'd abstractly understand that the place would be a horror to other people, but it wouldn't be to him. If someone denigrated the cells at the mansion, he would remind them that they had, quote, clean sheets and ample blankets, regular meals, adequate light, privacy that was scarcely ever interrupted. You're the picture of empathy, Severian. (laughs) But here in this little jail, it's all different for him. The darkness and stench are as oppressive as a physical weight. Just imagining himself being confined there somehow, even accidentally, well, and he can't even stop imagining it. His mind makes up scenarios where he'd be unexpectedly locked up there. In other words, this is the first time that Severian's really kind of seeing from outside of himself. Mm -hmm. It's almost like saying, even when I was a prisoner after I'd done that thing with Thecla, I still didn't really know what it was like to be a prisoner, even though- Because he was home. Yeah, he was still home, but now he's. It's the first time where he can start to. I mean, you you joked about you know the the picture of empathy or sympathy here, but but that's kind of what this is. It's like one of the first moments where he's starting to see things from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the yeah. way it feels to be there as as a prisoner where you don't belong. Yep. So he comes to the cells. He can hear a woman crying in the first one. His prisoner is in the third one on the right. The doors in the Madachin are are metal. These are wood bound together by iron. He can hear crying in this one as well, but it stops as soon as Severian pulls the bolt back. And there, Agilus is naked on the straw. He's wearing an iron collar with a chain attached that is attached to the wall. And Agia, with long brown hair is bent over him. Just like we said in chapter 21 in the hut in the jungle, that this is the first time I have really keyed to the fact that Ajia has brown hair and not black hair, which mildly argues against her being Severian's twin sister. This moment is the first time I've keyed to her having long hair. All the other times I've read this, I've imagined her with short hair for some reason. I don't know why. She turns and this is the first time Severian realizes it's Agia and Agilus in the cell. And we should note she's naked too. Right, right. They're both naked. And he says, quote, their faces were so nearly alike that Agia might have been holding a mirror to her own. So, Greg, let's talk about that. <laughs> that could be her own face, right? He could be wearing a mask. Unfortunately... The bands or tattoos or face paintings that Severian has remarked on twice are not noted here in the cell. He does make a reference to them. It's not clear that they are evident now or even there. There's no reason to suppose that they aren't there either. It's possible that Ajlis is wearing a mask that is so high tech the guards didn't take it off him. But there's no way to know definitively what it is, because Wolf doesn't tell us. Even though Severian remarks here again about the strip of black behind Agilus's ear. By the way, that's new. And I think that makes it unlikely the band is a tattoo or face painting, unless we imagine Agilus with a shaved head. It's behind his ear. Over his hair is the way I'm imagining it here. If Agilus is wearing a mask, The ears seem to be part of that mask. And when Severian first saw it in the shop, he says it's, quote, a finger width from the hair above his ears. I think a lot of people imagining face paint or tattoo read it as a finger's width from the hair above his ears. But I think the totality of the description demonstrates it's a finger width from the hair above his ears. That is from where the hair touches his ears. Anyway, I'm trying to understand why Wolf didn't think this was breaking the rules as an author. Why isn't he breaking the contract between the writer and the reader? I get unreliable narrators, sure. The narrator who can't tell me something because he doesn't know about it. 
or even one who lies about things for motivations that are known to the reader. But in this case, Severian has seen those bands. And if they are not there anymore, he's in a position to remark that it isn't there or to investigate if it is. The point is that this is the obvious place to explain those bands. I'm open to discovering you know, why it makes sense for Severian not to remark on it or to obfuscate the fact if he doesn't, but it's a serious breach just to stop there. And if I'm not willing to accept Ajia at face value, it's stuff like this that is the reason why. Yeah. And I keep going back to something that Michael Swanwick said about the end of Tracking Song, where he said, you know, and then then comes the the figure with the wings, which mm-hmm. if you're as smart as Gene Wolfe explains everything. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a joke, but I think maybe what he also meant was if your headspace is in exactly the right place that you know what you're looking for, then yeah, that solves a lot of problems. And mm-hmm. I feel like maybe Wolfe had in his mind that what we would need to figure out what these bands were, but there's something that just didn't happen in communication or what he expected to be a good enough clue. Just, yeah. I don't know. Just like you said, I mean, that difficulty of just picturing exactly where they are or what the bands are. Right. It's like, that's a problem. So (laughs) yeah, I agree with you. This is one of those places where I can't help but feel like unless he was intentionally trying to be elusive and mysterious and confusing about something, I can't help but feel like there's, there's been some kind of a misfire. Yeah. Yeah. And look, it's been 40 years. No, every People have <laughs> agonized over these bands and they have all kinds of theories and I don't like any of them. But back to the cell. Severian, so when he looks at them, he's just totally drowning, even as he put together the pieces in his mind. But that isn't possible. And Ajia says, you, because you lived, he has to die. Um, Sorry? <laughs> so, so Agilus says, you still don't get it, do you? <laughs> and then he explains the scam that we've known throughout this, these episodes. The scam that I have been slowly willing to accept is genuinely going on, despite how preposterous it is. Agia, in the Septentrion costume, he calls it a costume, not a uniform or a disguise. She's the one who challenged him. When Severian came into the shop, and after examining the sword, when he wouldn't sell, Ajla signaled to Ajia, he says, if we take him at his word, then he's the one who's in charge of this scam. He tells Ajia when to put on her gear and when not to. He gave the sign when Severian, quote, wouldn't even talk of selling the sword. Ajia said, walking like a man isn't as hard as men think. I suppose. You know, hooray for you, Ajia. But... <laughs> Severian still thought it was a kid, you know, a youth underneath all that armor. The next part gets interesting here. Now, remember, Ajia says that she and Ajilis inherited the rag shop, this costume shop, this Goodwill store from their mother. But Ajilis knows a lot about swords. And Ajia had a misericord that she got, she says, from her mother. I don't know where that is going. Ajilis says... Have you ever looked at that sword? The tang should be signed. The the tang is the portion of the sword that separates from the blade and inserts into the sword hilt. Ajia follows up in a toneless voice. It's signed by Jovi, and I saw it at the end. And remember that Severian dismantled his sword to clean it at the restaurant. So that's when she would have seen it. It's not obvious whether she herself knows the significance of it being signed by Jovian or if she only looked because Ajla told her to look. Now, Wolf summons a bit of noir stage direction to announce the pair's plan is being fully revealed. Quote, there was a tiny window high in the wall behind them, and from it, suddenly, as though the ridge of a roof or a cloud had now fallen below the sun, a beam of light came to bathe them both. I looked from one aureate face to the other. Is that just a beam of light? Is is a beam of life always just a beam of light? Or is it just dun dun dun? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, last chapter we had the we had a light on his sheet, right? That he mm-hmm. kind of thought, well, I'm not sure that was really just a light. Yeah. This one feels a bit more like you said, kind of noir stage direction. 
right? I mean, like mm-hmm. that seems like a perfect kind of thing for it. Again, though, we've also got sun imagery, and anytime we get sun imagery, we're supposed to be um, on the lookout towards a moment of something good or something mm-hmm. uh, moving a step towards something better. At least in this sense of Severian finally seeing what's going on, there is that that he no longer, at least, is getting fooled by these two, right? And, he's not going to be fooled by them any time further. So from here on out, even when he always finds out that, that as is after him and he just, he never gets caught right. um, <laughs> until the very yeah, end. We'll have somebody shining a light and saying, we're here, we're here, we're looking yeah. over this. <laughs> I mean, I don't know anything about Ajlis. So theoretically it could be a sign of who knows what about Ajlis. I don't know anything about Ajlis, but. I, all I know is he's weird. Yeah. The only thing I think is different is that it says that the light shone on them and bathed both of them in light. And again, we got to remember it's, it's red sunlight here that's right. coming in, not mm. perfectly bright light. Uh, so it could be putting a red pall on them, you know, yeah. like casting them as guilty that when we think of it that way or as murderous or something like that. Um, there is that angle to it as well but i just it's you know i normally i would think if if he's being shown off as the good guy here that that a white light would shine on him but instead we're getting a red light shown on the two of them Mm -hmm. one other detail that he says is that both of their faces were then oriate the 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 light made both of them look oriate and if you look it up that means like a saint or it could be a saint it also means golden the oh, only no. reason I would say golden, this is a bit of a stretch for some curiosity earth as we've talked about with Ajia before, but if she is artificial to uh-huh. have her look a little bit metallic, yeah, uh, even golden, mm, that could well be yeah, a sign sure. of something that they're artificial in some way. Maybe, maybe. I know that's a big stretch just for, yeah. for Oregon. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, all, some of these things, once you decide that they're true, oh, you start seeing, once you discover they're true, they, you see signs uh, that are left all over the place with Wolf. And so, you know, that could very well be true. So Severian says, you tried to kill me just for my sword. Ajlis explains that he didn't want to. Quote, I hoped you would leave it. Don't you remember? I tried to persuade you to leave, to flee in disguise. I would have given you the clothes as, and as much money as I could. There's a break here. This next part could be either said by Ajlis or Agia. Severian, don't you understand? It was worth 10 times more than our shop, and the shop was all we had. Honestly, I don't know how much the shop is worth, so I can't say whether six Christos Ajlis offered was a fair price or not. But apparently... What was offered was beside the point, and we'll get to that in a minute. So Varian says, so you've done this before, legal murder. You can just kill people right out in front of everyone. Ajia says, well, you know, what about you? You're going to kill Ajlis, aren't you? That's legal murder for profit. You're going to get paid for it. What have we done that you're not going to do? Ajlis is cooler, but he plays a similar game. It was a fair combat. We were equally armed, and you agreed to the conditions. Will you give me that kind of chance tomorrow? (laughs) Severian says, no, no, no. Quote, you knew when evening came, the warmth of my hands would stimulate the Avern and that it would strike at my face. You wore gloves, and you didn't even have to wait because you were well-practiced in throwing the leaves, which is to say that there was nothing fair about the fight, and you took steps to ensure that it would be less fair. Ajla says, eh, good point. And then, I won, but in reality, you won by some concealed art neither my sister nor I understand. In truth, you know, Severian doesn't understand either. Now, Ajla presents a peculiar ethos that I think it is worthwhile to investigate. Yeah, I love this part. This is yeah. one of my favorite parts of this. <laughs> he says, quote, I have been wronged by you three times now. And the old law says that a man three times wrong can claim any boon of his repressor. I grant that the old law is no longer in force, but my darling tells me you have an attachment to times past when your guild was great and your fortress the center of the commonwealth. I claim the boon. Set me free. 
Severian says, okay, I'll bite. How have I wronged you, uh, Agilis? First, by entrapment. You carried an heirloom worth of villa around the city without knowing what it was you had. As owner, it was your duty to know, and your ignorance threatens to cost me my life tomorrow unless you free me tonight. Secondly, by refusing to entertain any offer to buy, in our commercial society, one may set up one's price as high as one wishes, but to refuse to sell at any price is treason. Agia and I wore the gaudy armor of a barbarian. You wore his heart. Thirdly, by the trick you used to win the combat. Unlike you, I found myself contesting powers greater than I could comprehend. I lost my nerve as any man would, and here I am. I call on you to free me. All right. Craig, before we go on, let's talk about that old law that is no longer in force. What does Ajlis know about ancient laws? At no point will any person Severian encounters in the Commonwealth speak of a law like the one Ajlis describes, one that seems based as well on a kind of hyper-reverence for commerce for commerce sake. It smacks of a kind of weird old chivalry. Yeah. It- I, it's all BS, right? I mean, he's just totally making things up right now. I mean, this is not, I I think they're still trying to play Severian for the kind of naive fool here where he's like, I'll, I'll make him think there's some kind of old chivalry here mm-hmm. that can go on because as you said, that he likes old stories of, you know, mm-hmm. forgotten things. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think personally, I don't think there's any real old law he's talking about. He's just making this stuff up. Huh? Well, I propose. Curiositas Urthus. I propose that Agilis is from a different time. He's a sailor from Zadkiel's ship or a near light speed ship dropped off from a time. I'll try again. Dropped off out of time and forced to shift for himself as a pirate in the Nessus market. Why does he wear a mask of Ajius' face? How did they come by it? I can't say at this time, but he's not from around here. Or if he is from around here, then he's not from around here in recent memory. Okay. Now that's fun. Because if we're, and especially too, even if we're we're going back to the old, Ajia is eventually going to be Heather's, or is mm-hmm. or was Heather's sex doll, then Agilis pretty much needs to be something from a ship too. Right. So yeah, that's, that's a fun way to think about it actually. Okay. Now let me spin a theory against the belief that Agilis is wearing a mask to make him look like Agia. I don't see particularly how this can be, but this additional aspect is inviting. Severian describes Agia as having long eyes when he first meets her. And Severian describes Agilis's face, and therefore Agia's face, flat-cheeked and tanned. So I've repeatedly argued that Agia is Asian in appearance. In Claw the Conciliator, Jonas is going to bring up another Asian character, one who never seems to make an appearance, Kim Lee Suang. The people in the antechamber are descendants of Kim Lee Suang. He was, what, a, a pilot? Could Agilis be Kim Lee Suang? Now that's cool. <laughs> um, hmm. So it means he would have made it out of the antechamber somehow, right? Or at least... And yeah. travel, maybe got back on the ship, or, or maybe, you know, no. who knows? People Apparently people are dropping in and out of time in the Commonwealth all the time. So... It's not. It's not impossible. Well, and we know that they're descendants of Kim, mm. and so who knows? Maybe, maybe he and Agia were the originators yeah. of the line of people. If you're going to take that route, then right. she would have to be connected somehow. Anyway, of course, it could be as simple as Agia being born in the antechamber and escaping. I mean, sure. And well, that would explain okay, her that's, appearance. That's fascinating. That's a connection I haven't heard anyone else say before. Um, hmm. I got to play with it. Seems <laughs> I, I, it's one of those things on the surface seems incredibly unlikely, but I like it a lot. Um, 
Uh, huh. Yeah. It's the, the trick is that I could never figure out, and I don't know if I'm just misremembering something or forgetting something. If the way that Jonah seems to have figured it out, if the, the Kim character had to have died and, and like been in the Anna chamber, or if he was just like the remembered patriarch of this group of people, I can't remember. Hmm. But, uh, the connection at the very least, it does suggest that something about sailors being somehow Asian characters mm-hmm. might have a broader connection here. Yeah. Huh. I know it look, it's a stretch, but Ajus is Asian in appearance, assuming he's not wearing a mask, and maybe he's a sailor from another time. Yeah, it's not a theory out of nothing. It just it, it, it kind of happened when I when you get all of the pieces together in one room, and then you say, "Wait a minute, <laughs> these things look like they they could go together." Yeah. And I hate to say it, there's there's a, a there's not a joke in here, but maybe Wolf is playing with the idea that especially if these are people who aren't used to seeing Asian faces, that mm-hmm. he would think that they're much more similar than maybe they oh. really are. And when oh. he sees two identical faces, that would be um, a terrible bad joke. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it would be, but it, but if if we're talking about a, a world where he doesn't even recognize, yeah. really, yeah. Hmm. Uh, we'll set that to the side for a minute because I I, I want to think about that and come back to it again. But I also love these three attempted arguments that he makes here. The first, the idea that it's Severian's responsibility to know how valuable the thing is that he's carrying around, mm-hmm. so that can't make other people desire it mm-hmm. uh, which is apparently what he means by entrapment right here that he's like you tempted me by not being aware of how <laughs> valuable your thing was um that's it's just crazy weird backwards argument but it's but it's it i don't know if it shows agilis being desperate or being really sort of dexterous dexterous in how he's trying to convince him of things here well it reminds me of rumsfeld saying that Weakness is a provocation. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, it's exactly, pretty much exactly that same kind of idea. Um, and it goes back to the, the thing before when even Asia was saying, Severian, don't you understand? We were poor and it was so valuable. She's like, you've got to understand. Of course, we were going to try and rob you because <laughs> we were so desperate and you had so much. You have to understand, which is crazy. Um <laughs> But and then the second one, then he's he gets to what you talked about that sort of crazy capitalist mindset of you refuse to buy or you refuse Not to even sell. capitalist, but highly commercial. Commercial, yeah, that's that's what it is. It's more commercial than than capitalist. That yeah, that the fact that you would refuse to sell at any cost that that's just outrageous and and it's treason. <laughs> it's it's a <laughs> it's a crazy way to get to. It. Um, and the third point, too, where he says that you had powers I couldn't comprehend, it's basically him saying, you deceived me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, all they've done is deceive him, too. And in some ways, you know, you could turn all these arguments back on him, like with the second one. And, you know, that that it's wrong of Agia and Agilis to say that you're wrong for not accepting our price, that we offered right. it. And therefore, you have to. Yeah, well, that's that's ridiculous. Right. And. The same thing can be price that you know is too low. It's too low, exactly. And then for the first one, entrapment goes the other way that they certainly have a responsibility to be fair to Severian if Mm. he doesn't seem to know how valuable that thing is. So yeah, they're totally one sided and very desperate arguments, but they're they're so fun because he actually makes them sound convincing for half a second. (laughs) Severian just laughs out loud. You are asking me to do for you, a guy who attempted to cheat and murder me, what I wouldn't do for Thecla, who I loved almost more than my own life. I'm a fool, and if I wasn't one before, your sister made one of me, but not as great a fool as that. Asia gets up during this conversation. Again, remember, she's naked. She brushes the straw from her knees and, quote, rounded thighs. And she acts like she's only suddenly realized she's naked and picks up her blue-green gown she's been wearing for the last two days. Blue-green. Okay, let's talk about the nakedness. Agilis is in prison. For all I know, it is part of the procedure to strip 
prisoners naked. Severian doesn't say so. They didn't do that at the Matachin, and Severian doesn't remark on it. Maybe if the only thing he's wearing was that armor, he had to be naked. I don't, I don't find that compelling. I could also imagine that they require visitors to the cells to strip naked, so that they can, so, you know, that they can't pass an iron file. But that's not what's happening here because Asia has her gown with her. She took it off when she came into the cell. What is going on when Severian entered? He heard crying just before he entered the cell. Who was crying? Severian mentions no tears on anyone's faces. Now, we very early batted around the possibility that Asia is the sex doll, Hathor's sex doll. But on consideration, I don't think this scene can, confirms that. I propose that the two of them were having sex in the cell just before Severian entered, and that's why they're both naked. And, and what Severian heard outside the door was not crying, but the two of them having sex. Yeah. Which also just makes it seem like everything else that they're doing here is deceptive because it would seem that they're, I, I don't know. I, if that's the case, I don't feel like it means that they're just weird and incestuous. I feel like maybe what it means is that they're actually not brother and sister and that mm-hmm. some thing is, is going on here yeah. that just adds to the deception. I mean, it certainly, it could be all those other ideas about, you know, her being a sex doll or robots mm-hmm. or something or artificial in some way or, or the other. But unless it's just here to sort of add weirdness on top of everything else to make them incestuous, it seems to me to point to something very different in their makeup. Yeah. In fact, Agilis is going to, in a minute, offer a certain advantage that people believing that he's her brother affords him. Yeah. So at this point, Asia, who has been demurely clasping her gown in front of her as if to hide her nakedness, just drops it and rushes to Severian to kiss him to death. She takes both his hands and puts one on her breast and the other on her, quote, velvet hip. Severian moves his hands to her back and she says, Severian, I love you. I longed for you when we were together. I tried to give myself to you a score of times. Don't you remember the Garden of Delectation? How much I wanted to take you there? It would have been rapture for us both, but you wouldn't go. For once, be honest. She spoke as if honesty were an abnormality like mania. Don't you love me? Take me now. Here, Ajlis will turn his face away. I promise you. She puts her hand in his pants. His breeches, actually, remember. But suddenly he realizes her other hand is sifting through his saber tash. She's picking his pocket. He says, I slapped her wrist, perhaps harder than I should. And this description is difficult for me to understand. I mean, how do you slap someone's wrist hard enough to cross the line? A slap on the wrists is a metaphor for punishing the least possible. I don't know. Anyway. Ajia now runs at him, clawing at his eyes. It's very in tips that Thekla used to do this when she'd get frustrated being in prison. So that's new information. Mm -hmm. Severian pushes her against the wall and her head hits the stone. Severian says, although it must have been padded by her abundant hair, the sound was as sharp as the tap of a mason's hammer. (laughs) Now, you think there's anything significant about that sound? Does it suggest her head is made of something besides normal human noggin? Well, it's certainly one of those things that could suggest that he actually pushed her really hard. Mm-hmm. And despite what he says, or it could be, yeah, that that maybe he was pushing her lightly, but she's metal, you know, or something. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's just awkward enough to suggest both. Right. You know, cool that it it kind of suggests both, but but yeah. Um and one other thing I want to say here that about Asia that just every time she shows up, she just switches from tactic to tactic to yeah, tactic. That's true. So quickly, which always amazes me. Like first they're trying to argue, then she's trying to seduce him, and then she's trying to attack him. And all of those little things just lead up to me to make it seem like she's just a little less human. I mean, yeah, certainly you can see that it's just desperation the way that she's doing this, but it's also completely irrational. And it's yeah, she's like, trying to save Ajlis's life. Supposedly she's so broken yeah. up over Ajlis, but she's really 
just spending your time trying to get the claw out of Severian's saber tash. Uh-huh. Yeah. And we're going to see in a minute, Aishalis probably doesn't even know about the claw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, the padded hair. Apparently, her hair is not just long, but big. She has a thick, thick. head of big hair. Yeah. Anyway. And, to the other way you can read that line is that Severian is underselling exactly how hard he pushed her. Yeah, that's and, true. Well, that's, that's, sure that's absolutely true. Yeah. Totally violent and trying to say... But and we know that he can, he's well trained. I mean, we we see him eventually just take people out with no problem. Right. So he certainly has the ability. When her head hits the wall, quote, all the strength seemed to leave her knees. She slid down until she was sitting on the straw. I would never have guessed that Aja was capable of weeping, but she wept. Now, Aja is not angry, and he's not worried at all about the, any of this. He just calmly asks without emotion, only curiosity. What did she do? She was picking my saber tash. His coins are still there. Two brass orichocks and seven copper ears. Well, he figures maybe she was trying to steal the letter of introduction to the Archon of Thrax. What could she do with that? I have no idea. Of course, she's after the Claw of the Conciliator that she put there when they were in the Pellerines Cathedral. Ajalis is certain that she was after the coins. He says, they fed me, but she must be dreadfully hungry. And Craig, this is a pretty strong argument against the two of these people being artificial, right? But he might be covering for her. Maybe he's wearing a mask, but he doesn't know she's artificial. He might well know what she's after. I don't think so, though. I feel like this is a hint that Agius Heist was a free agent action. Mm-hmm. It probably appears that I'm theorizing in every direction right now, but that's only because I am. <laughs> well, we've agreed that Agia is hard to She's figure a hard out. one. She's a hard yeah. one. Yeah. So Severian picks her up off the floor, forces her dress into her arms, opens the door and leads her out. She's still kind of woozy, so she lets him. But then he gives her an aura chalk. Now she comes alive. I'm imagining her suddenly staring at the coin in her hand. She throws it on the floor and spits on it. Now, I've already proposed that her anger is not based on Severian getting rough with her or for not having the decency to die in the duel. Her hatred for Severian is tied up in her tremendous love and desire for him which she doesn't really understand or especially realize. That's my take, anyway. Severian goes back into the cell where Ajlis is sitting with his legs crossed, his back to the wall. He says, don't ask me about Ajia. Everything you suspect is true. Is that enough? So I gather what he's saying, Craig, is, yes, we're doing it. Agilus is philosophical about Agia. He's going to die and she'll be with someone else. He wanted her to have already married someone else and continue to see him on the side. He figured it would be easy since he's, finger quotes, her brother. He mentions Hathor, the old sailor who's always creeping on her. So if Agia and Hathor have a history together on the quasar and his little yellow pine box, I don't know. Maybe it's not known to Agilus. So once again, Agilus is the big con man planner. Agia takes his lead, but apparently if she's artificial, you know, she's not without free will, but it's not obvious to me why Agia can't run the shop by herself. It seems to me that it would be no less profitable and with only one person to feed, it would be better. I could argue that this is a mere cultural expectation in the Commonwealth or Agilus's culture, his ancient culture. The point for Agilus is that his one regret in dying that he won't be able to enjoy Agia anymore. Now, Severian gets down to his official portion of his visit, taking requests about the execution and explaining how it will go. Do you care how you look on the scaffold? And, Craig, it turns out he does, particularly since Agia might be there. He hopes she won't, Given the chance that she will, he cares how he looks. So his relationship with her is not merely one of business and sexual appetite. But as Severian has previously said, sexual desire and love are not two entirely separable things. 
We get a reference to Ajlis' hands, for what it's worth. Slender and rather soft. They're in the beam of the light that landed on his and Ajia's head before. So Severian instructs him as he was taught to instruct clients. He says, eat only a little in the morning so that he doesn't throw up on the scaffold. And he should pee before the event because otherwise he will after his head is cut off. And he gives him the routine of how the execution will go. It's designed to make the client think the final moment hasn't come yet when it actually has. It's supposed to be an act of mercy, but I imagine also ensures you know that they won't flinch and mess everything up. He's not sure whether Agilis was fooled. Obviously, Agilis is a man who's adept at not revealing his inner thoughts. Severian says, I do not know if he believed me, though I hope he did. If ever a lie is justified in the sight of the pan creator, it is that one. So one other thing here, talking about light, because we get light shining in one more time. That's where he sees his hands, but he says that also his hands lay in the narrow beam of sunlight that had given his head and as he is an aureole a few moments before. Given their heads in that, that's where you definitely get the saintly idea that their right. heads had that aureole. The I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but it's it's the the circle, the halo that you see mm-hmm. in especially a lot of medieval paintings or icons or things like that. Um, that is a weird way to describe them, I think. And unless it's just supposed to be ironic that they had that and they're the criminals here. Otherwise, it makes me think that is there some other sort of vague symbolism we're supposed to be getting from? It feels symbolic for sure. So because they're doomed or they're the criminals that, that they're, there's a moment of holiness for them because they're about to suffer. Yeah. It, it could be that. Um, I don't know. Or I, it's hard. It, it's easy to start thinking, oh, well, is there something otherworldly then? Because they're sailors. Or that, that or they're them- working for the higher heroes. Or yeah. 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 I, don't I don't know. It seems like a big reach. And it's mm-hmm. probably the, the more likely thing would be that, yeah, they're they're suffering and they're lowly. And that's a way to, to sort of a moment of grace or something like that. But but I just wanted to point it out because it is odd. It feels <laughs> like a symbol of something, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have the same feeling about that light that I did about um, Thea's doves. And I don't know what it means. So, But it's interesting that Severian's ethos views that any lie, even that one, as needing justification. And, you know, Craig, now that I think about it, Severian rarely lies to anyone on these pages, although he says in chapter three that he does, or at least did, do it all the time. Now, Severian leaves the cell. We only have two more sentences, but the puzzles in this chapter are not at an end. On the floor, outside the cell door, the brass orichok is gone. Agio wasn't too proud to take it when Severian wasn't around. But there on the stone floor is a design that has puzzled readers for 40 years. Severian supposes she scratched it with the ore chalk. And after all, you know, what else did she have? What is the design? Severian can't really make anything out of it. He says that it could have been the snarling face of Jupari. Since Severian guesses that first, I'm inclined to doubt it. We'll come back to Jupari, but let's consider the other things first. The other guess Severian makes is that it is a map. Now, this is interesting because her next big scene is going to be directing Severian to the Man Ape's cave. So she knows about that cave. So it could be a map of the cave, it could be a map to the cave. But why would she need to draw a map to something she already knows? A map is a communication device. Most writing and images are a form of communication. So to whom is she communicating? The other feature is that the design is encircled with characters that Severian doesn't understand. And then the last sentence of this chapter is Severian rubbing out the design with his foot. Also potentially feels like a symbol of something, but I don't know what it is. Do you have any idea about the 
the purpose of this design, why she would draw it, what it's doing, what is the what's going on? Well, I know what it suggests to me in the long run, but first a couple things that I just to deal with some of those possibilities. One with the map, one thing and I was trying to think if I had read this on the Earth list somewhere or not, but someone thought that if it was a map, maybe it was a map for Heather saying, mm-hmm. here's where to find me, something like that. Because we know that Heather's going to come. I don't know that Heather would be able to get that close in there, like to be right outside the uh, the cell. But, you know, he's going to be there. He's going to show up in the next chapter. Mm-hmm. So it could have been that. Um, what I think it is, is a suggestion that Asia at least knows something about how the witches work or how, if not the witches, then something about the sorcerer's tribe mm-hmm. that later. Like that's, that's a common idea. I think Borsky brought that up as is connecting he, her here to the, the sorcerers that he fights and uh, sort of the lictor. I feel like that's the connection we're, most supposed to make because that's the only other time that we see sort of strange writing like this. I think at least un- unless I, unless there's other times that I haven't noticed it. And it's the only time that it seems like you could really connect those two things that don't really have anything to show anywhere else. The one thing I don't know is if it's supposed to be, if the strange characters are supposed to be something that maybe sailors could use. I don't think so. There's never another time where the sailors are talking about using a script that's totally different like this. And it really is just in the sorcerer's jungle or in the the jungle sorcerer's group that he has any kind of other encounter with weird writing like this. So that's to me, the most likely suggestion is that somehow she's connected to that group. Now, what it actually means, I don't know. Um, I've still got a lot to work out, but Um, at the very least, what it does is it absolutely connects Asia to something else, to some other weird, something that's going on that if we've had all these suggestions about things about her that just don't seem to add up. And this is the last thing that we get really from her in this part. And it solidifies that idea that, yeah, there's more going on with her. So, I mean, now granted, it could in the end just be like, she's so mad and this is some little <laughs> curse that she learned from her older, you know, from a friend when she was growing up and it's mm-hmm. a hex that, that she's told to put on him, maybe, mm-hmm. but it just doesn't feel like that. It's not unsatisfying. <laughs> I do like the, yeah, yeah, I do like the connection with the witches because as I've said, I've, there's lots and lots of hints that she's with the witches that she's on the run from the witches. So yeah, that's a good one. The one other thing too, is that in castle of days, Jurapari is one of the words that he, that he chooses to define. And he says, it's the devil of the Uape tribe. Mm -hmm. So the Uape tribe is an Amazonian native American. And it is a local South American tribe. And now technically, if you look up Jurupari, it's a fish. It's the demon earth eater is what you're going to find if you look on Google. That's not the definition that Wolf gives, though. It's the devil of the tribe. Um, So it is you have a demon, a fish called a demon, and then Wolf calls it a devil. Now, here's the trick. The Uape tribe is a real name for some of the Native Americans in the Amazon. That could be connected somehow to those sorcerers later on. It could also be Wolf just saying that she knows some kind of folk magic mm-hmm. from this. Era. And again, that makes it seem maybe like it's just a curse. Right. To call it. Well, you know, literally the name Jurapari has come to mean demon or devil in Brazil and and other places around the Amazon. And most commonly he's an evil jungle demon who brings nightmares and disease. Now there is a legend that the first Jurupari was born to the first woman right after creation. He had no mouth and could not eat or talk. One of the first men nourished him with wind. Now the creator God asked the boy if he were a fish and he shook his head. No, an animal? No. A human? No. A Jurupari? And he nodded yes. And suddenly he had a mouth and he opened it wide and roared. And shortly after he saw some boys steal fruit from their parents and the Jurupari opened his mouth wide and the boys thought it was a 
cave and went there to hide. And then the Jurupari carried the boys back to the village and vomited them up in front of their parents. Now, the concept of the Jurupari demons has, like you said, been associated with an Amazon fish called the Geophagus Jurupari, meaning demon earth eater. It's also called Satanaperka Jurupari, meaning devil perch demon. That's even scarier. Now, our former earth lister and legendary theorist Lee Berman, known as B Sharp on the list or B Sharp Flat on Reddit, he associates Jurupari in that story about the cave mouth with Agia's drawing and with the man ape's cave and the fish in Father Aniri's mirrors. There's a certainly a lot of pieces there, and I'm sure much of that informed Wolf's attraction to the word, really, and the story itself. But I think the Jurupari that is in Severian's mind is as closely associated with the sort of beneficent Jurupari. Severian refers to the drawing as possibly, quote, the snarling face of Juru Pari, proper noun, not the snarling face of a Juru Pari, common noun. Juru Pari, the proper noun, is an entity associated with certain male exclusive rituals in the Amazon. The story is that only men can use the sacred flutes, so the Juru Pari rituals, the women can't touch them or approach them. But once upon a time, it was women who had exclusive use of the flutes. In some accounts, the women stole them from the men. And so at that time, the men had to do all the household chores. So the son looked down on all this and is very dissatisfied. I mean, you get it, right, Craig? We all do. <laughs> he sneaks down and indirectly impregnates a virgin. And this is how Jurupari was born. Now, Jurupari is not the son of of the sun, he's the emissary, like a certain prophet of Typhon's time. In seven days, he grows to about the size of a 10-year-old boy, and everyone's amazed by his wisdom, and he lays down new laws and customs regarding the religion of the sun. He changes society from being run by women to being run by men. In some versions, Jurupari stole the sacred flutes from the women and hid them, and then taught the men to perform the rituals without the involvement of women. The thing is, that if women see or interrupt these rituals, they're killed. And these rituals, by the way, involve masks and dancing, and the etymology of the word has been associated with that. So there's a connection to the Matachinas sword dances of the Torturers Guild. Well, Jurupari's mother, she sneaked over to observe her son and the rituals. And Jurupari saw her, but he didn't know it was her, and he killed her with a gesture. And with her body, he made the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters constellation between Orion and Taurus. Sometimes it's described as Orion's net. And of course, there are all these Christ elements here, what with him being born to a virgin. But now the question, what does Jurupari look like? And that is not an easy question, as you'd think. According to some rites, from Jurupari's ashes grew a type of tree from which the sacred flutes are made. So it's all very cyclical. So sometimes he's a tree. Also, he resurrects in the way that Hyacinth did in the Greek myth. And sometimes he looks like a Native American man who's just exceptionally wise and powerful. And sometimes he's an invisible baby. And in other times, he's just an invisible presence, you know, like an invisible cat or a man who's gone into the mirrors, making a gym shine like a blue light. Who knows? <laughs> but sometimes... I think this is the image Severian is thinking of. Sometimes he looks like an ugly, crooked-mouthed rural Indian, uh, the equivalent of a Brazilian hillbilly. The name Jurupari is then said to derive from crooked mouth, thus snarling face of Jurupari. Hmm. Uh, the thing is, I don't think personally that Jurupari matters because I doubt it's actually a drawing of Jurupari. It could be a map. thing is... What is that drawing, that map, that symbol supposed to mean? Who's it for? What's the meaning of the characters encircling the design? Craig, you know, you mentioned it as a clue. Like you say, it could be associated with uh, witches, but you know, what does it do? Would it be Ajia and not Hathor who is summoning monsters the way the Kameyan summoned Apu Punch out? Right. Do we even know if she drew it? I don't know. 
And I was even trying to think, he says that it was surrounded with letters that I didn't know, which made me mm-hmm. think, okay, are those not letters, but are they numbers or some kind of exactly. something? Right. Something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, very often the first Severian theory has given me an explanation when no others could, but I've applied the test to this scene, this design. <laughs> and although I can write alternative story, the first Severian and Agia and Agilis, the design itself has no evident place within it. And then he rubs it away. So it's yeah. not like <laughs> you could pick it up anyway. Right. Uh, yeah, that one I don't know. Um, now, all that background on Giropari, I think, is fascinating, again, for all kinds of suggestive reasons, but I just don't have anything to hang it on to no. in the rest of the text. Um, I would really wish there's some way that it was some kind of story about revenge or something, because <laughs> then it would be so much better with Agia. Yeah, be- exactly. So this is my. This is now my symbol. This is my religion. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, well. But no, one thing I do know, though, is that this solidifies all my feelings that there's got to be something else going on with Aja. Yes. And that she's, she's <laughs> not just the sister, that some other complicated backstory is here. Yeah. And even that ties, too, with even with all the weird lying and deception, they still knew something about who made Terminus Est, and they knew how much it was worth. Mm-hmm. And they had this knowledge somewhere. And just like you point out, she's got her misericord. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole extra level of strange background about weapons and fighting, which is like not exactly Jurapari, but, but still a violent background that we just don't know more about. Exactly. I don't know. Well, um, we'll just see. (laughs) Maybe hopefully someone has some help for me to do to help us here. If only Aja would show up again later so we could have more information about her. <laughs> well, obviously she's gone for now. So <laughs> well, we laid out a bunch of things there. That's a mess. That that chapter is a mess. I don't, I'm so Sorry. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah, it's I don't know. I'm getting frustrated with Aja. Not 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 in a bad way. Not like I mean, I just uh, yeah, it I was hoping that the more we worked through it the more things might add up. I don't no, know. There's but, no, there's um, just, there's just more threads. The more we go. Yeah. Lots of suggestions, lots of ways to start putting the story together, but you're right. Nothing that absolutely solidifies. I don't know. It's kind of the thing, like one of the things that kind of bugs me about things in land across is kind of how I feel about Asia. Sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, why, why make me think there's a whole other bigger story? <laughs> but then don't fill it out. Unless honestly, that was the point. Like, unless it is just to add to the, the mystery of what's going on. And I have to admit it could be, you know, it's that, that could be it. He might have never but, expected us to figure it out. He might've just yeah. said, this is, you know, this is something I'm going to put in my pocket. Yeah. We certainly hope you have comments, thoughts, corrections, and complaints. I'm anxious to hear universal theories about Agilis or the design outside the cell door. And yeah, wrap all that up for us. That'd be yes, nice. Yes, please. Yeah, nicely. But put a little bow on it. And bring your comments to us on Facebook group, on the subreddit, Twitter, email. You can find out how to do all those things on the show notes. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your wolf reading friends. And, you know, until you hear from us next, may the more favor you. Thanks, guys. could do is just uh, rehash that whole uh, political thread that now has well like 250 comments <laughs> or on it. oh does it really just keep going that's the problem with those long after it's stopped becoming interesting at all can we get a moderator to do something <laughs> there, there is no moderator <laughs> oh he's an atheist yeah. <laughs> aren't you supposed to say bye oh sorry I, take care <laughs> I'll just do that.